and welcome to another segment of Conversations in the Nick of Time. I am your host, Nikki Roach, and we are always delighted and honored to have you lending us your ear and your brain because we're here intentionally to drop some nuggets of wisdom, instruction, guidance, insight um, to you whatever your path and journey may be. Um, Conversations in, in the Nick of Time is a platform that is um, the destination for mentoring moments with a global influence. And we do that by inviting absolutely amazing thought leaders and experts in various industries to come and share their insight, um, their lived experiences when it comes to um leadership excellence, accidents, and equity. And I'm telling you, like today is a topic that I've been wanting to tackle for quite a while, um, but I want to turn our attention first to who she is, um, absolutely beautiful soul. Um, and once we get um, to this point, we're going to explore her gifted area. And trust me, it is going to be quite interesting for you to learn of these strategies. Want to give a thank you and a shout out to our sponsors and partners, Ah TV Network, ALA Public Relations, All In Music and Media, KSTL Jubilee 690, Mosaic Ceiling, Sparkman Publications, and you. We thank you also. So I want to turn our attention to our guest, and she is none other than Dr. Janet Crone Kennedy. Got a special little something surprise in regards to how I met her and then how we reconnected. But first of all, she is a clinical psychologist and sleep expert with two decades of specialized experience treating sleep disorders. She is the founder of NYC Sleep Doctor, providing psychotherapy, coaching and consulting services. Dr. Kennedy spent eight years at the Manhattan VA Hospital as a health psychologist and assistant director of the outpatient mental health clinic where she developed and implemented a multi-site sleep disorder treatment program. Dr. Kennedy is the author of The Good Sleeper, The Essential Guide to Sleep for Your Baby and You. She's ex she's extensive in her contributions towards this topic, um, has been on television, in print and media, online publications, podcast, radio, and the list goes on and on. Born and raised in University City, okay. now residing with her beautiful family in Brooklyn, New York. Dr. Kennedy, how are you? I'm great this morning. How are you? Doing very well. And I am uh, most excited because this is a topic that is becoming so um, dear to me. Um, <laughs> but I also want to learn of your, um, we're going to first hop into your journey, sure. how you even arrived. Just a little background though, what's interesting for those who don't know, we graduated high school together. Um, I think we were in alignment, what, sixth grade through 12th grade? If Probably I'm so. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I've not seen you since I know. I a year. No. <laughs> I know. A certain number of years. <laughs> and I'm just honored, you know, to have you here and just thrilled to learn of your success and the progress that you've made. Um, just how, how did you land in this space? Um, it's so, so concentrated. Yeah, very much so. Well, it started out, I just wanted to be a therapist. And I was thinking back and realized it, it kind of started in U City where I volunteered at Youth Emergency Service as a peer counselor starting at 14. And then, you know, just kind of continued on that journey to become a psychologist, went to college at NYU graduate school at NYU, and then did my training, uh, my pre-doctoral internship training at the VA hospital in Manhattan, which I loved, um, particularly because they had a health psychology rotation where I spent six months of the year working in, as um, a liaison to mental health to other medical services. So um, when I left there, they asked me back to be the um, primary um, health psychologist on, on staff. So I was developing programs and uh, training interns and doing all this really great stuff. 
But the first thing they said to me was, we need you to fix sleep because at that time, and this was 20 years ago now, there was, they were very concerned because they were prescribing a lot of Ambien um, and they didn't know, um, I mean, it was helping for sure, but people were relying on it every night and that's not really how it was intended to be used. Mm -hmm. So they asked me, um, and this is what was beautiful about being at the VA. They let me block out a lot of time in my schedule to research and find the right kind of treatment program for our veterans. And I was able to do that. It was really eye-opening. Um, and it was really just adapting cognitive behavioral therapy skills I already had and had, you know, been trained in all along the way to this very specific problem. And um, so, you know, it, I ended up putting this program in place, training a lot of other clinicians and interns to do it. And it was really remarkable. Um, you know, I won't say that I fixed sleep for all veterans by any means, um, <laughs> but it was definitely an important part of the treatment program. And for people who really um, preferred not to rely on medication. It was life changing. Um, so then what ended up happening was I would just, you know, you go to cocktail parties and people ask you what you do and you start talking about it and people are like, well, where do I get that? How do I find that for myself? And what, were you, what were you saying? I, I, I fix sleep on the sleep. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, I do this sleep program. I teach people how to get off medication, um, how to sleep naturally. Um, you know, it only takes four to six sessions and people are just like, what, you know, like, I can't believe this. And, um, so it was clear that there was a need in the private sector. And, um, and then I started to hit some roadblocks at the VA because, you know, I was having children. I had two kids. I didn't have a, a whole bunch of children, but I had two kids, which, you know, raising a family in New York city, raising a family anywhere is hard, but, um, I found myself, you know, racing at the end of the day to pick up two kids at two different daycares on the subway. And, you know, you just feel like you never get a break. And I was really trying to work with them because at that time at the VA, I was doing, I was by then doing a lot more administrative work, um, program development, things like that in the mental health clinic as the assistant director and really tried to find a way to transition back to work after my second child in a way that would allow me to get some traction by just doing some of that admin work at home. Um, and they just weren't down for it. Um, and to, and actually, it was, to go back to working with the actual patients, you're saying? No, to go back. Well, I wanted to go back and work with the patients, but what I also wanted to do was have some flexibility to do some administrative work from home so that I could save two hours one day a week to like maybe yeah. go to the gym or, you know, I don't know, meditate or get myself together or, you know, just not be so crazed all the time. I got you. I got you. Um, and their offer was, well, you can go down to four days a week, but you can't work from home. And so you'll have to take a 20% pay cut. And oh, whoa. Yeah. I mean, right. It's the, with the, you know, to me, that felt very um, presumptuous that I could afford somehow to do that, that somebody was taking care of me in a way that, like, oh, my income doesn't matter. I'll just take a 20% cut um, to be with my babies, which is what it, not what I was planning to do. I wanted to be working wow. with my babies in daycare so that I could just be more effective and efficient and a whole person. And, and, um, that and was, they, and they fought and resisted against that. That there was, was some years ago. For it. Yeah. And that was some years ago. And look where we are today, right? Look where we are now. Yeah. So, um, you know, in any case, I did take the pay cut and, Oh, wow. spent that, you know, my, my Wednesdays at home. And I was trying to build this practice because I realized like I have something marketable here that I can do that will eventually um, make things easier for us. Right. That I'll be, you know, I can uh, make some extra money and, and maybe launch out on my own. And um, 
you know, after one particularly bad day at work, my husband bought me my URL, uh, which is nycsleepdoctor.com. And, and then I just, that's a great gift. I know. Right. He was like, let's not mess around here anymore. Like you can do this. And, and then it turned out, I, in fact, I could not do it just, just one day a week. And I ended up just, you know, asserting myself and saying like, we've got to just dive in here. And so I went back to halftime at the VA and took out a loan to sort of fund the difference for my, uh, in my salary for a few months while I really got this off the ground. And I did. So you did, whoa, pump the brakes. <laughs> <laughs> because here's some lessons here. You took the, first of all, you had buy-in from your family, from your husband, yeah. Um, the babies, you you still had to work around all these schedules because the employer put up a roadblock. So mm-hmm. you had to come up with this strategy. He buys you an URL as a gift. <laughs> I am totally now that to me, no more shoes, no more purses. <laughs> buy me, buy me some um extra storage in my my, <laughs> my Google Drive, right? Right. Um, so you do that, but then you decide to take the leap, you stay part-time. Mm-hmm. I had to. You stay part time, but then you take out a loan to yeah. make up the. Di- and let me tell you when that was. That was 2008, me. right in the crash of 2008. And I was like, what have I done? Like, I just gave up half of a government job in a recession with benefits. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked. It worked. So, but, but but it sounds like I'm getting from you. There was no other option. It didn't feel like it. It really did not feel like it. And and how old were your babies at the time? Because you, they were so. Oh yeah, my daughter, my youngest was eight months old, and I had a four year old. So it was crazy. And I was, you know, everybody was like, "Oh, this will give you all this time." I was like, "No, I was working." harder, longer hours. I never, you know, I was answering emails on weekends, all hours, because part of what I did when I first set out was I was um, work uh, to keep overhead low. I was going and doing home visits for parents with young babies and toddlers. And so I wasn't paying rent on an office and I was only, you know, just when I had the job, I was in it, you know, and, um, so I was running around all over the city doing these home visits and with then babies. with babies, not sleeping babies and parents who were just in complete crisis. Uh, and and then they would need me all the time as, you know, they were getting things settled with their babies. So it was it wasn't like emergency room care, but it was like, you know, people expected me to be available. So I never got to turn off. and. Um, it was pretty grueling, but also really rewarding because it was my own, you know, like if I was doing that for the man, then like, I would don't think I would have felt so good about it, but I was really seeing this thing build. And I did all this like guerrilla marketing where I just go everywhere. I went, I had flyers and postcards in my backpack and, and would just, if there was a pediatrician's office, I'd go and like stick the thing up there. And I was you know, handing it out of doctor's offices to get adult patients um, to come see me. And, and I never paid for PR. And the biggest investment I made was my website, which was the best thing in the world. And, and just doing, you know, back in the day, doing things like this, being, um, you know, blogged about by somebody else just helped my um, visibility online. And it just grew and grew to the point that after three years, I then had to take another leap and say, the VA is holding me back. I'm not, I'm not able to grow my business the way it, it needs to grow with this halftime commitment. And so I finally left, which was bittersweet. I mean, I was certainly resentful um, at the sort of what felt like anti-feminist treatment. And I, in fact, found out later that they allowed someone else to do the same thing I was asking for, which made me quite bitter. Um, But And I, but I did hate letting go of working with the veterans because I loved that work and um, it was, it was extremely rewarding. It taught me so much. I felt like I was, you know, doing something really important. um, And, you know, I missed that. I still have a couple of veterans who call me on my work line to check in on me. That's so sweet. That's (laughs) very sweet. sweet. 
but it's it's so interesting how you have this um you've just kind of zigzagged your way. Mm -hmm. And so I have this thing where, as I'm doing research on my guest and also um, the work in which they do, and there's a word that lands for me and the word for you that um, just easily came up was discipline. Mm. And so discipline is defined. It is um, a noun it is in, in, in action, of also a verb. Um, but the noun is control gained by enforcing obedience or order, orderly or prescribed conduct or pattern of behavior, training that corrects, molds, or perfects the mental faculties or moral character. And as a verb to... Um, train or develop by instruction or exercise, especially in self-control. And so as you're talking, I'm like, oh my gosh, this, this word did not like this, <laughs> this did not land incorrectly because as we focus on you and your journey in this part of the conversation, it is so amazing how you were very, it seems you were very clear on what you were trying to do once you realized there was something there mm -hmm. um, because you were being sought out. And a lot of times we will say, oh, your gifts will make room for you. But sometimes we can be so busy in the doing mm -hmm. um, and not being, and we kind of miss, we can miss some opportunities. Um, what would you say looking back was the thing that caused that that propelled you to say, let me lean into this a little bit more. Well, it started when I gave birth to my daughter because my older child is a son. And when I was in the hospital with her, I was a little bit high on hormones and was, you know, she was just so beautiful. And I said to, and I was already struggling at, with the situation at work. And I just said, I'm going to find a way to work this out. I'm going to be, an example for you. And it was very, I mean, it was profound for me. I, I can see her little tiny face now, 15 years later, as I talk about this. Um, and then I just, um, I just hit this point where I was like, I am, I'm being very responsible about what I'm asking for. And I understand what it means to the people I'm asking it of. And, and I just hit this point where I was like, this life is too hard. I can't be all these people at once. And, and so I've just got to figure this out. And it was a risk. You know, we live in New York city. It's hard to raise a family here. We don't have family support here. It's, you know, we don't have a lot of cushion um, you know, we have a stable living situation, but that's about, you know, like, and that's a lot. Yeah. But and I've lived in New York and yeah. I understand there is just this constant hustle, this constant movement. Yeah. And it's a beautiful thing when you can pop in and pop out, but when you're there and you are trying to settle, even just, you know, during that time, um, just as a single individual at that time, it was still very um fast paced the still pace very, is very it is very fast and then when you are trying to make ends connect and pay two thousand dollars you know with two other roommates <laughs> like I'm like oh let's my talk God. about daycare <laughs> that and so that's what I'm saying I'm saying as a single person <laughs> like do you want to do you want to get a metro pass to go to work or do you want to get some soup, you know, right. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, fortunately, we've been here a long time and we've we we're not in that we're not making those kind of choices. Otherwise, we would have had to leave with our, our and raise our kids somewhere else. But but yes, it's all you always feel like you're on that edge. And and I love it here. I mean, I yeah. I wouldn't be here if I didn't love it. And but it is a lot and it is a choice to live with that kind of energy. Um, but I just hit this point where it was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be part of New York. I'm going to be this person in New York yeah. who provides this service, who has this business, who is this expert that people, you know, talk about and, you know, 
but then eventually, you know, I was, I was speaking at all these moms groups and one of them, um, at one of them, there was an, an editor who came to me and was like, you need to write a book. And I was like, I can't write a book. And she's like, I'm, you know, I'm too, you know, I'm too green at this. And I, I don't, I don't have anything new to say. And she's like, you do have something new to say. Wow. And she helped me through the process of getting an agent and writing a proposal. And I, and then she bought the book. And, um, so my book is out there, you know, like that, all these things where I just believed in myself, even through all of the self-doubt and I'm, you know, not saying it wasn't there and isn't still there because it is, it's a natural part of us as human beings, but, um, to be basically just be like, no, this isn't right. I've got to find something better and being confident that if that wasn't going to be the thing, I'd be able to land somewhere else or, and, um, and, and, you know, maybe have a more traditional career, but um, be fine, you know, like, Mm -hmm. so to, to take that leap for myself um, and to have the support really um, from my partner who, you know, you know, shouts from the rooftops about what I do, you know, he's excited about it too. So it's good. And um I've been really fortunate. Um, I'm happy to be where I am now, for sure. What would you do different now that you, you know you're you're <laughs> more than 15 years past that point where you had a, a, a real pivot? Um, and I love that you mentioned um, you believed in yourself. Also, your spouse believed in you. Mm-hmm. you told, I mean, we can go down that rabbit hole in regards to support. <laughs> And how that that matters. You know, a lot of times we'll say, all I need is to make up my mind, which is true. But um, it does help to have that um, that that hand in your back, you know, mm-hmm. and, and in the air, meaning celebrating mm-hmm. you. What would you have done different, though? I think I would have waited a little bit longer um, to start. It was really hard. My baby was little. I was very stressed. I had, I had postpartum depression even. Uh, I didn't, as a psychologist, didn't recognize to be something I needed to deal with. I just kept thinking, this is just because I'm unhappy at work, or this is just because, you know, I haven't settled into whatever. Um, and it, it was, it was postpartum depression. And if I had maybe gotten treatment for that, maybe I think the thing I would have done differently is gotten treatment for that. I wish I could kind of call myself on the phone back then and be like, just, you know, like, this isn't right. Do something about it. And it might have helped me sort of be, I was definitely deliberate and driven, but there was like, there was a kind of panic involved in that, that was pushing me really hard. And so I don't regret doing it by any means, but I think maybe if I'd given myself a little more time to just, you know, as to settle in with where I was as a mother of two kids, maybe get my son in kindergarten or something where you're like, it's free. (laughs) One of them, right? (laughs) Yeah. Right. But you know, in the end, I don't, I don't have regrets and I feel like I did all the right things. And it's interesting to me when you say that we're disciplined because it is such a, it, it does define both my, personal practice and what I help people with. But at the same time, I don't want people to think I'm not also real messy in there too. You know, like I can, I'm, you know, like within, you should see my desk. Like I, you know, I'm on top of everything, but it is not neat. And so (laughs) that, and I, as much as I, every year I'm like, this is the year I'm going to have a neat desk or I'm going to go through my makeup drawer and throw out all the, or like, you know, my, uh, you know, like con Marie, my closet, like I'm, I never do that. It's always messy. And like, that's just, that's me. And I can still be disciplined and successful, um, in all these, uh, you know, like as a parent, as a partner, as a professional, um, as a, you know, as an entrepreneur in a way, you know, like, yeah. and I like that you were very transparent in the fact that yes, things are great, you know, and, and I'm showing up to do things in excellence. However, it is, me- I mean, being, it's messy. It's Mm -hmm. not always, you know, how we think it is. And I think that's going back to discipline. Oftentimes we will think that, you know, even just hearing this word as well as excellence, that 
everything is in order and mm-hmm. there is it is in order but it's kind of like organized chaos you know if you could use that mm-hmm. language mm-hmm. around because it you have to be able to tolerate the mess to achieve what you want to achieve like we're not talking about perfection excellence is not perfection and when you're but it's people get that very confused and you know i work with a lot of perfectionists who are failing at perfection and it makes them extremely anxious and then they can't sleep even being perfectionist about your sleep. Like, so, you know, it's the idea of like, of, of having strong goals and believing in yourself and achieving and moving forward. And, but that involves flexibility as well, because you have to take what comes at you and say, okay, I'm going to make this from that. This isn't what I intended, but, you know, here comes this new path for me. I mean, I I, I never set out to be a sleep doctor and here I am. And, um, it, you know, and it's really important. Yeah. And so then you have this ability to position yourself because I heard you say you never pay for PR or you <laughs> didn't pay for PR at least getting started and a lot a lot of times we can get paralyzed in moving forward because we don't have certain things especially mm-hmm. when well now we have so much um, at our fingertips mm-hmm. but it was different even just 10 years ago yeah we had access to um what what was it that stimulated you in regards to like um, strategy to do that guerrilla marketing yourself? <laughs> I was broke. <laughs> I didn't have the money. <laughs> I was really focused on keeping my overhead low and and it worked. It, it worked. You know, I was like, who do I need to get to to get referrals? And so I, you know, I did a lot of emailing. I did a lot of, eventually I did some actual like snail mail mailings. Um, but it, you know, doctors are really happy to have resources. So, you know, it was, it, it worked out really well. And and the other thing that, that started happening was people were talking about me on, um, like for the parenting stuff, which I don't focus on anymore, by the way, but the parenting stuff, there were all these parent boards and there was one even in my neighborhood in Brooklyn and people started talking about me. I mean, some people didn't like my methods and had, had not so nice things to say, but most people were saying, no, like it's, she fixed it. It's worth the money. You won't believe how different it feels when your kid is sleeping, you know, all that stuff. And, and that was just enough. So I just went with it because the other piece of it is I'm kind of a a small operation. I'm one person. I don't have, you know, I could hire people. I've decided that I don't want to manage anything more until I'm not parenting. Um, And then I'll kind of see if that's how I want to branch out. But like the idea of more people to be responsible for right now is not appealing at all. But But that's being very clear on what works and you're defining success for you in this season. Mm -hmm. We will think just because I'm making this decision now, I have to continue to carry it through Mm -hmm. um, for years to come. But no, this could just be for the next six months or the next 12 months. Love that you have been honest about where you are as a business, but also as a person. Mm -hmm. I think we often fail to be honest about what it really is that we want. Mm -hmm. You want it to be these different people. You want it to be there for your kids. You want it to also have some time for Dr. Jen. (laughs) Um, And 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 then you have your spouse, but then you also need to just, if you're talking about helping other people, which we're going to get into, you have to make sure you keep up with the discipline, you know, for yourself and, while these decisions may not be easy all the time, but I'm very impressed how disciplined you are because, I mean, you're very clear as mm-hmm. to like, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. I could do this, but here's why I'm not doing that. Mm-hmm. Why yeah. That's a lesson in itself. Well, I think it comes down to values and like we think about values in bigger terms, but I think 
it's helpful to sit down and think about what are the things that are important to me in all aspects of my life? And am I, how am I prioritizing? How am I fitting that puzzle together now? How do I want to be doing that in the future? And, and so the idea of like valuing friendship, valuing um, success or, you know, valuing service, family, um, downtime, whatever, you know, travel, spirituality, you name it, but like thinking about your, how your puzzle fits together and making sure that you don't have to, you don't have to do everything perfectly, um, but that you're not neglecting something that's really important because that's what leads to anxiety, depression, paralysis, you know, you name it. And, and so having that balance of your values as your guide. And so you can say to yourself also, like, so for me, like, yes, um, building my business be, you know, and, and seeing where it can go, like that brings me a lot of joy. It makes it energy, but right now it also is, you know, really important to me as I'm launching my children, uh, you know, through high school and getting into college and uh, that, that I'm, I have the headspace for that. And, um, and I don't feel like I'm, you know, somehow not, not present, even, you know, not, and it's not even physically present that it's, it's, mentally present, able to think about things. So, so for me, that's, you know, that's always on my mind and I haven't always been thrilled with every sacrifice I've had to make in one or the, you know, but, but being, um, attuned to it helps. Yeah. I am, um, so excited to present, uh, Dr. Janet Crome Kennedy, who is the sleep doctor, the NYC (laughs) sleep doctor, um, (laughs) clinical psychologist, sleep specialist, founder, and author. Um, so we're just excited to have her on sharing with us more about her journey, as well as, um, getting into some best practices regarding her area of expertise. According to the most recent data from National Health Interview Survey, the proportion of Americans getting no more than six hours at night of sleep which is the minimum for a good night's rest for most people, rose from 22% in 1985 to 29% in 2012. Then also there was an international study conducted in 2017 by the Center for Creative Leadership. They found among leaders, the problem had worsened. 42% get six or fewer hours of shed eye per night. Is it a myth that we really need the eight hours? It is a myth that everyone needs eight hours. So the, you know, the average person needs somewhere between seven and nine hours, which is a lot, right? Yeah. I mean, most people don't need nine. So, um, but that's, you know, that's the, the frame of reference that we start with, right? That comes from National Sleep Foundation. um, And they have a lot of, data to back that up. Um, But the problem is that if you are someone who says, I need eight hours, and your biological set point is less than that, then you run the risk of actually becoming very anxious about your sleep, doing things to try to get more sleep that actually makes things worse. um, And it can cause a lot of problems. So it's really important to figure out how much sleep you need as an individual, whether it's six and a half or seven or eight and a half, you know, it, that comes from setting a consistent schedule, really setting a consistent wake time. So you can figure when you set a consistent wake time, it starts to tell your body what time you need to go to bed and you'll find that consistency that way. So, so I approach it with curiosity. 
um, as opposed to saying, well, you know, U.S. News and World Report says if you don't get 7.2 hours of sleep every night, you're going to have dementia. Like that's not helpful to people who value sleep. It's helpful to people who don't value sleep to say, no, it's not OK to to sleep when you're dead. Like you you will be dead sooner if you don't sleep some now, you know, like. <laughs> I know I've been guilty of saying that a number of times. It's like, no, I've got too much to do. Yeah. But as we get older, and this is why it's something that is very, um, very much of interest to me all of a sudden when it comes to health and wellness, period. And this is a part of it that we don't, don't talk a lot about. However, it impacts everything we do mm-hmm. if we get the sleep or not. And let me back up and say, so I was with a family family and friends gathering at a a home event, an event at at one of the um, cousin's house. And as we laugh, because we're all around the same age group and we laugh because it's like, man, remember we could do this like all night, but around 10 ish, everyone's like, okay, um, should have been gone an hour ago. Um, And we're really, (laughs) we start early now. Mm -hmm. And what was so interesting is that the conversation came up about sleep and there is a drug that starts met- metatonin? Melatonin. Melatonin. It's a, it's a supplement. Yeah. So <laughs> I was probably one of the very few who raised their hands or verbally said, yes, I, I yes, I have that in, in the, at the house and I, or I'm using it on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. I was floored. And I'm like, this cannot be good for the system. Mm -hmm. Um, It cannot be good mentally. Um, And then what is keeping us from going, like naturally going to sleep? So Mm -hmm. first question, what's the deal with these supplements and this medication? Well, so there are supplements and there's medication and then there's over-the-counter medication and there's prescription medication. So supplements are not regulated by the FDA. Um, some of them can be helpful, like magnesium can be helpful. Um, even CBD, um, which is yes. you know, derived from hemp. Um, it's not, it's not going to give you a high or anything like, um, THC will, but, um, CBD, um, things like there's L-theanine, there's all kinds of things. And there's melatonin. Now of all of those things, melatonin is the one I say no to because, oh. um, Well, because it's a hormone that your body produces naturally and it regulates your entire circadian rhythm, not just when you fall asleep. It's not designed to put you to sleep. So I know. And I bet the, the jar you have in your medicine cabinet is something like five milligrams or 10 milligrams. And all of the studies show that the effective dose of melatonin um, is at a half a milligram to one milligram. So everybody's taking too much. It's also, if you take it on a daily basis, it stops doing anything good. It might start doing things that are bad, like, um, affecting temperature regulation during the night, because that goes with your circadian rhythm. So if you notice you're having hot flashes in the night, um, if you notice you're waking up at weird times or too early, I'm not saying that melatonin is the only thing causing that if you're a woman of a certain age, but um, it's certainly not helping. And so people take it and they think, oh, it's a supplement. It's just, you know, like vitamin D is a supplement and it that doesn't hurt, right? But melatonin is different. It's good for jet lag because it tells your body that, you know, when you go to another time zone, your body doesn't... Eat, isn't producing melatonin at the right time. So if you stimulate that with a low dose of melatonin in the evening, it helps you adjust to local time more quickly. Because melatonin is is calming us? No, no, no. Melatonin is what tells your body to go to sleep. Okay. Like it, okay. It's not it's it's not a calmer. Okay. Um it it's it's the hormone that regulates the sleep wake cycle. Gotcha. And, and the on off switch for that is right behind your eyeball and it is responsive to light. 
So when you're getting a lot of, this is why they say, don't have blue light before you go to bed. Don't look on your phone, things like that, because that's directing blue light directly to your melatonin on off switch, which then keeps the melatonin off and, and delays your the light concept. Yeah. Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. So then, okay. So then you, so sleep aids, you want to talk about sleep aids? Sleep aids. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Quick. I'll be quick. So basically, um, if you're getting something over the counter, that's a sleep aid, that's not a supplement. It's some form of an antihistamine because that's the only thing that's approved to be over the counter. Um, so your z your Unisom, your mm-hmm. um, Tylenol PM, any of that stuff, it's some form of antihistamine. And that can be helpful for a couple of days. Um, but again, you get used to it and um, it becomes less effective. And it also affects your um, cog- cognition, mm-hmm. um, like your sharpness. It affects your sleep architecture, which is the the way that we travel between sleep cycles during the night. Mm-hmm. And it also dries you out. Um, so okay. that's over the counter. Prescription sleep aids range from things that address anxiety, like Xanax or Clonopin, which are highly addictive. Um, also, they ha- they do dramatically affect sleep architecture in ways that um, it are not good long term. Um, and then there are the the ones like Ambien um, that are a a different sort of that of the they're they're not true benzodiazepines like Xanax they're um, but they have some of those qualities. Um, So they're not as addictive physiologically, but anyone can get addicted to anything psychologically. So if you think you need to, you know, knock on the door three times and pull your covers up and down six times to fall asleep, you're going to feel like you can't fall asleep if you don't do that. Mm -hmm. If you think you need to take Ambien to fall asleep, you're going to be, and you don't want to, you're going to be lying there struggling with whether you should take it and that's going to activate you and keep you awake. So, you know, I'm not against sleep aids for, for acute needs. Like let's say um, you're under a tremendous amount of stress. That's very, um, you know, short lived and you really want to be able to sleep to, to stay on top of that. Like I would support that if it was, you know, a week maybe, um, or you've lost a loved one and that really profoundly affects your sleep. That might be a a reason to take it occasionally to sort of make sure you don't accumulate a huge sleep debt. But when you're taking a sleep aid every night, um, you really should try not try to get some help to fix the actual problem, the underlying problem. And that's where I come in because, um, it's the, the medication treats the symptom of sleeplessness, but it doesn't fix the underlying issue, which could be anything from just doing the wrong things like bad behavior or, you know, or unhelpful behavior, or it could be anxiety or depression or, um, you know, because we don't always, yeah, because we don't always realize that we're under stress. I know for myself, you, you know, you get to the point to where there's a stress level that you think you're handling mm-hmm. and you think you're juggling successfully, but not knowing um, there are other effects that are happening, yeah. even though you think you're, you have it under control. Not Sleep necessary. is like a barometer for that, right? It oh, yeah. is sort of, it, I mean, not for everybody. Some people can sleep through anything, but, um, but, you know, very often, uh, you know, a sleep disruption is kind of an indication that, um, you know, you're on the rocks a little bit. Yeah. 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 So then we have all of these things that um, I'm sure many of us have been guilty of, whether it's a supplement, um, over the counter, prescribed, blue light (laughs) (laughs) at night. Tell us, okay, because you mentioned that already in regards to when we talk about blue light, meaning that cell phone, that iPad, that even TV, right? Like yeah, but TV's not, TV's not right in your face. So it's kind of the lesser of all the evils. And I don't, I don't have a problem with TV at night. I like TV at night, not in your bedroom, but um, to Wait watch. Wait a minute. Out. No TV in the bedroom? <laughs> no, I was, I was huge advocate for that. I just... 
within the last, I would say seven to eight years. Yeah. I put one in, but I stopped taking my cell phone. Yeah. At well, night. Mm-hmm. At night. So I leave it on a counter. Um, but it also back to discipline, it helps me stop at a certain yeah. point, leave it on, but I didn't know the hour before bedtime to disconnect so that we can begin to ease yeah. into that. Okay. So, I mean, but the, the problem is that the world we live in is really amazing, um, but it also is very new for our physiology in that we have information coming at us all the time. We have these okay. amazing devices that let us do so much more than we've ever done. We are multitasking. We, you know, you sit down to do your work and you're checking email, you're buying groceries, you're doing all this other stuff. And, and so your brain is pinging around all day long and it didn't used to do that. And you used to go home at, you know, five, six o'clock and not have access to any of that. You picked up something to read. You watched the news at, you know, whatever, 10 o'clock. And, but it wasn't this constant, like, oh my God, I haven't checked the news in, in half an hour. What's going on in Congress or, or what's going or the on? Ding, in- the, even the ding, yeah, the notification, because I took a lot of those off yeah. my phone because you think you're like, oh, you know, it's no, no biggie. No, even if it dings, you're still giving it attention yeah. even for a split second. Yeah. And you can tell the difference when you take that off yeah, um, versus having it on. Because it's designed to create a tiny bit of panic, yeah, you know, like, and so if you're constantly being like tr- triggered to use yeah. a common word, but, um, but it, it's just alerting you and it's stimulating this response of like, oh, there's a problem. There's a problem. And that makes your nervous system exactly. on alert. All the time. And so it's hard to focus it and you get on kind of overdrive. And and I think about what the brain is doing all day long as like being on a highway with, you know, in the express lane with no exits. Right. And like so you're there and you're like zooming, zooming, zooming. You cannot come to a full stop and then dive into bed. You have to have an, an off ramp. It's like exercising. You go for a run. You, if you jump right in the shower, you'll still be sweating when you get up. Your body needs time to cool down. Your brain needs that too. And right. so it's not just the blue light. It's what all of this stuff represents. Yeah. It's every time that alert goes off, it's plugging you back into your day. You're only one click away from your bank balance or, you know, yeah. like looking at somebody else living their best life, supposedly on social media, like all of these things that keep us plugged in when the body needs a chance to recognize that it's night and it's time for it to do this other thing. So, so giving yourself that time. And I'm not saying you have to every night have like a beautiful bath with scented candles or like, you know, do a whatever meditation. Like I'm just saying, put the phone down. Don't be on your phone while you're watching your show, put the phone down, watch a nice show, do your, self-care routine, whether it's, you know, half an hour or five minutes, and then get yourself into bed with a book. And it, gotcha. and my number one recommendation is to do that with fiction because, you know, my, my colleagues in this field will say, don't read in bed. Bed should be only for sleep. I like to read in bed because then I don't worry about walking to bed sleepy and waking myself up. Like okay. people get very superstitious about it. I'm almost asleep. I don't want to wake myself up. And so if you're reading in bed, you just put the book down and there you go. Stop. But what's beautiful about it. And I discovered this myself in graduate school when I was like overrun with stress and all the other stuff. Um, reading fiction at night, it, because you get involved in somebody else's story, you leave your own aside and, and the body and mind. It's an yes. Okay. And so when the mind disconnects from your problems of the day, then the body says, okay, there's no danger here. There's no reason to stay awake. It's my turn. And it pulls you into sleep, but the body will defer to the mind. The body will say, you know, you're still working on your, you know, to-do list. You're still thinking about 
you know, that problem from 10 years ago or what you said wrong in that meeting today, like we need adrenaline to stay awake. And so the body will give you that. So if you, if you really use a little bit of discipline to to (laughs) occupy your mind, you're kind of throwing your mind a bone. So your body can recognize that it's safe to sleep. Right. Um, and the nervous system calms down the adrenaline, you know, dissipates, and then you're in good shape. And it also does in, you know, my anecdotal experience with myself and everybody who follows my instructions, it does seem to improve sleep quality because you've got this space. You're not going to bed thinking about your stuff. Right. You're going to bed thinking about, you know, somebody else's stuff. And, but back to discipline, I am learning to at a certain point of the day to begin to wrap up Mm -hmm. regardless, even if I come home and do a couple hours, but I'm trying to even be mindful of that or protective of that. Not every day, Mm -hmm. but before I leave work, I'll like begin to shut down, but I will try to do some of those, that exact thing that you Mm -hmm. were saying, but I've not been intentional about it. And I, I, I could see how that totally could help because now you're dumping it out. Another thing I will do is in my, on my ride, my commute, Mm. I don't always have music or, um, an auto audible audio book playing. Um, I will have silence for at least part of the ride, Mm -hmm. which helps me just kind of clear some things out because then by the time I get home, depending on when I wrapped up, um, and, but now I'm not doing the six and the seven PM type of mm-hmm. thing. That was horrible because when I, you get home, you're rushing, you're trying to eat something, right. you're eating something unhealthy because you're trying to do it quick so you can get these eight hours, you know, the seven. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, so so there it does matter. But now, okay, there's some intentionality that needs to come yeah. around. And the wind down, you shouldn't skimp on the wind down either. Like, so let's say you do have a late night. And, you know, either you're working later, you go out or you're traveling or whatever. And you, you know, you think, oh, okay, I better get into bed the first minute I can because I'm already at a de- deficit. But you will sleep better if you take that time to just kind of sit and let your mind and body settle, do what you need to do and don't feel that pressure to race to bed because sleep is never about just one night. It's about all the nights. And so, so if you have a night that is short or bad, um, it's a data point, you know, and you really need to kind of be able to take that in stride and say like, all right, you know, my body can tolerate this data point, right? It knows how to, how to rebound it. I'm healthy and it can, it can handle that. Mm -hmm. Um, But if instead you respond to that by saying like, oh, now I better you know, spend the whole day figuring out how I'm going to get a good night tonight. That (laughs) applies all this pressure and that pressure becomes anxiety and then you're not sleeping. So it's it's that response. And I thank you for connecting the, this concept of mental health and wellness Mm -hmm. to sleep. And I know that I did find another article um, as we begin to wrap up from the Sleep Foundation, and this was written by Jay Summer, a staff writer there, and she talks about these benefits of sleep mm-hmm. and not to go too deep in them, but it improves the mood, um, healthy heart, regulated blood sugar, improved mental function, restored immune system, stress relief, athletic performance, um, healthy weight maintenance are just a few of the things that were mm-hmm. mentioned just by getting rest. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And what's important when you look at that list is not to take that as a judgment on what you're doing and, or, you know, and not to look at that in a perfectionistic way because perfectionism kills the, you know, satisfactory. And what we are looking for is good enough most of the time. And, and that's a hard thing for people because we like things to be binary. We like it to be great, fantastic, perfect, or, you know, fail. And, and that's not healthy, a healthy way to look at a lot of things, but it's not a healthy way to look at sleep. And so my philosophy is really, it's our job to protect sleep 
um, in terms of allowing the time for it and with healthy habits and a healthy attitude. And then we turn it over to the body to do this thing because you can't make yourself sleep. Sleep is, if you chase it, it's going to run fast. You know, like you have to trust that your body is going to do what it's designed to do. It might not, you know, please you exactly the way you want it to, but it's going to be okay. And when you have that trust, it allows sleep to, to revert to its natural function. Like it wants to be on autopilot. It wants to run the show. Um, and if you, if you trust it and do the, do these things to kind of let it know you care, essentially, <laughs> <laughs> then it trusts you. you. I'm here with you sleep. Yeah. But no, I mean, and, and, and that is a mentoring moment and um, statement that you are giving us in the nick of time because <laughs> the caring part, we, we may say that with our mouths, but with our actions, mm -hmm. that back to that discipline, um, understanding is like mental first, and then the rest catches up with us in regards to making sure that that rest is there. Because I mean, it, with this not resting, the rest of us can't rest, right? This being our brain, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Now tell us where we can find more about Dr. Jenny Crone Kennedy. My website is nycsleepdoctor.com. Um, and I am on Instagram at nycsleepdoctor. I'm not a very frequent poster, but um, if I'm up to something interesting, you'll see it there. Um and uh and linkedin as well so wonderful wonderful we will be sure to post that information dr thank kennedy you. thank you so much for joining us um definitely have to have you back because i would be sure, happy to <laughs> yeah i'm sure there will be more questions once this is um, observed by many so we will be in All touch right. want to thank each and every one of you for giving us your ear and your your mind also. Now we've given you something to put in your hands to be of service to you, making sure that you're sleeping well, but also being healthy about your strategy and your discipline. Thank you so much. Don't forget you already possess everything you need to be successful and to live it out as you define it. Go continue to show up and share out in the nick of time.